Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. In this video we're going to be solving two more integrals from the Cambridge Integration B as I've been doing in the past, but these are some really cool ones so they're going to get their own video here. This first one here we're going to be solving using some of Cauchy's amazing residue theorem um, uh, strategies. And this integral down here we're going to be use, solving using Feynman's trick. So we have two awesome integrals with two big names in them. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started on the integration. So this integral I think is really cool because um, it seems like it has some little trick to it that will make it really, really easy to evaluate. And there is a trick to it, but it's not necessarily the easiest integral to evaluate. So first thing we want to do anytime we see cosine of a sum is just expand it using um, our cosine of a plus b properties, right? So we're going to have this uh, integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine x times cosine of nx, cosine of sine x, and then we're going to be adding e to the cosine x, uh, sine of nx, sine of sine of x, dx. And these integrals look pretty difficult, but you see, since we have this cosine of sine x and sine of sine x, what that makes me want to do is um, put in the, uh, in the exponent here, e to the cosine x plus i sine x, because e to the i sine x equals um, cosine of sine x plus i sine of sine x, right? And that matches up really nicely with what we have here. So I want to be able to do that. So the first thing I need to do is I, would I, was, I want to consider different versions of these integrals. So for example, instead of having this first integral, let's consider the integral e to, of e to the cos from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine x times sine of nx times cosine of sine x. So it's the same as this integral right here, except I've switched this to sine dx. And so the trick here is that since I have this sine of nx, this integral actually goes to 0. And we can see this because because of the symmetry of the integral here, we can see that if we just set u equal to uh, 2 pi minus x, we're going to get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine u sine of negative n u, and then cosine of sine of x, uh, sine of u du. And as you can see, this is just negative the top integral. So if x, if uh, some variable y equals negative y, then y just has to go to 0. So we know that this goes to 0, right? And this actually is very helpful because this tells us that the integral from 0 to 2 pi of this up here, e to the cosine x, cosine nx of, uh, times cosine sine of x, is the same as the integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine x plus ix plus i n x times cosine of sine x. And the reason for this is because uh, when we expand this, we get cosine of n x plus i sine of n x. And we know that that part with the i sine just goes to 0, so we don't need to worry about that part. And then the other part just matches up with what we had before. Then we're going to do pretty much the same thing over here with our other part of the integral. And first off, we know that um, integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine x, um, cosine of nx times sine of sine of x goes to 0 because of the same trick we did before, 2 pi minus x, and then we're going to get negative the same integral. So since this goes to 0, that means that integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine x plus i n x times sine of sine of x dx equals i times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine x, blah, 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 sine of nx and sine of sine of x, right? So it equals i times this. So we can rewrite this as negative i times this integral equals this integral. And so we can go ahead and replace that on the top. So this just equals negative i. And then instead of sine of nx, we have e to the cosine x, i nx. 
And that's some really nice reorganization right there. Now let's go ahead and erase all this. And now we want to combine these two separate um, pieces of our integrand into one big term that can be easily integrated. So let's go ahead and do that. As you can see, they're exactly the same, except one of them has cosine of sine x and one of them has sine of sine x and then that negative i. So really, we can write this as integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine x plus i n x times cosine of sine x minus i sine of sine x, which we can also rewrite as the integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the cosine x minus i sine x plus i n x dx. And this right here is just e to the negative i x. And now we see that we can write everything in terms of e to the i x. So we're going to make a substitution z equals e to the i x. In this case, we can also see that um, ln z equals i x or negative i over z dz equals dx. And now, in order to change our bounds, this is actually going to be a little bit more difficult because as x goes from 0 to 2 pi, right, on the number line, 0 to 2 pi, z is going to go in the complex plane from 1 all the way back around to 1 in the clockwise direction. So we can actually rewrite this as a contour integral. So let's go ahead and make that substitution. So when we go from 0 to 2 pi, z is going to trace out a closed contour along the path absolute or modulus of z equals 1. And then in order to rewrite our integrand, we just have e to the 1 over z. And then we have um, e to the i n x, which is just z to the n, z to the n. And then our differential was negative i over z. So we have z to the n minus 1 dz. Now clearly, this function is going to be analytic everywhere except at z equals 0, because at z equals 0, we have e to the 1 over z, which is just going to diverge into what's called an essential singularity, which essentially means it's a singularity of infinite order. If we were to write out uh, e to the 1 over z as a power series in 1 over z, we would see that we would have 1 over z to the infinity as um, the power series goes to infinity. However, this doesn't really matter that much when we're integrating this function because when we're integrating, all we care about is the residue. And the residue is the coefficient of um, 1 over z in the Lorentz series of the function. So we just have to expand this as powers of 1 over z and then find the coefficient of 1 over z. So this right here, e to the i over z, uh, one, uh, 1 over z is equal to the sum from n or actually we can't use n because we already have n. Let's make k. k equals 0 to infinity of z to the negative k over k factorial, right? This means that z to the n minus 1 times e to the 1 over z equals the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of z to the negative k plus n minus 1 over k factorial. And just a reminder that we're looking for the coefficient of 1 over z. So that means z to the negative 1, right? So we're, we want this to be equal to negative 1. So negative k plus n minus 1 equals negative 1. If we, or if we solve for k here, we're going to get that k, uh, these are just going to cancel with each other, and we're going to get that k is equal to n, right? And so that means that the coefficient here is just going to be 1 over n factorial. And so the residue is just going to be equal to 1 over n factorial. And overall, we are going to get um, our integral should be 2 pi i times the sum of the residues, and we're also multiplying by negative i, so that's going to cancel with this. And the residue is just 1 over n factorial, so our answer is 2 pi over n factorial. And that is, in fact, the answer to our integral. So that, I think, is a pretty cool uh, way to, inter to um, <laughs> integrate, <laughs> integrate uh, contour integration into an already amazing integral. Uh, so let's go ahead and work on our other integral for today. So we have the integral from 0 to pi of ln 1 plus cosine x over 3 times secant of x dx. And the best thing to do here is to rewrite the secant of x as 1 over cosine x. Now one thing I want to point out here is that there's actually a very, very cool uh, solution to this problem if you go ahead and expand ln 1 plus cosine x over 3 as a power series. And it's a, it makes the problem much, much, much more difficult 
but I think it's really interesting and a lot of you can have a lot of fun with it. So if you want to give that a shot, it's a very, very difficult infinite sum, but I would definitely recommend giving it a try because it is a lot of fun. All right. Anyway, we have um, ln 1 plus cosine x over 3 over cosine x. Something that I notice here is that I have this cosine x in the bottom and I have this cosine x inside this function right here. So I'm inclined to do some Feynman integration, uh, which really should be called the Leibniz rule, but I'm going to call it Feynman integration. Um, so I'm going to just put some variable here. We'll call it a for now, a cosine x dx, and we're evaluating this at a equals one third, right? And we'll call this a function of a. I don't know why my dx is all the way over here. Um, dx equals f of a. And the reason we're doing this is, of course, so that we can just differentiate with respect to a. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to differentiate with respect to a. So f prime of a equals the integral from 0 to pi of natural log, or actually we don't have natural log, sorry, of 1 over 1 plus a cosine x dx. And naturally, this cosine x gets canceled out because of the chain rule. Now, the best way to deal with this is to just use wire stress substitution. So u is going to equal tangent of x over 2, and 2 over 1 plus u squared du equals dx. So we get the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over, um, we're going to have 2 over 1 plus u squared, uh, 1 plus a times 1 minus u squared over 1 plus u squared. That just comes from the double angle identities. Then once we multiply this all out, we're going to get integral from 0 to infinity of 2 over 1 plus u squared plus a minus a u squared du. And the important thing to note here is that um, at when a equals 0, f of a is going to equal 0, right? And we're searching for the value when a equals 1 third. So a is always going to be less than 1 in this situation. So we're going to get the integral from 0 to infinity of 2 over 1 plus a plus 1 minus a times u squared. And 1 minus a is greater than 0 du. Then we're going to divide by 1 minus a. So we're going to have 1 minus a integral from 0 to infinity of 2 over 1 plus a over 1 minus a. Uh, plus u squared du. And then to integrate, we're just going to use our classic uh, arctangent integration right here. So we're going to get 1 over square root 1 minus a squared after we simplify everything. Uh, actually, we're going to get 2 over that, and then we're also going to be multiplying by pi over 2 because uh, integral from 0 to infinity, and we're getting arctangent, right? And so those twos are just going to cancel. So we have, let me just make some space f prime of a equals pi over square root 1 minus a squared. All right. So this means that f of a is just equal to pi times sine inverse of a, which I think is pretty cool, of course, plus c. But then we set a equal to 0 and both sides equal to 0, right? So that means f of a is just pi sine inverse of a. Set a equals to 1 third, and our answer is pi times sine inverse of one third. All right, uh, that's also a pretty cool solution. Um, pretty a much trickier problem and not too difficult to figure out. But you know, I always love some classic Feynman integration. It's something that doesn't get brought up too much anymore on this channel because I've gone on to much uh, more complicated things. But you know, Feynman integration is always fun. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, just wanted to do some of these more difficult problems pretty quickly in a separate video because I think they merit their own video. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.